Nicholas Verne, and as your Animus president, I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's Animus Basic Science Virtual Symposium. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind you of a couple upcoming events. Uh, we have the AMS clinical meeting on July 26th to the 28th uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. Also, our AMS Ironwood Diversity Development Award application deadline has now been extended until May 1st, uh, 2024 uh, at midnight. With that, um, I'd like to start out this evening's our AMS Basic Science Virtual Symposium. Title is Microbiome neuroimmune interactions, and the gut brain. What is new? Our moderators this evening are Dr. Jamie Belkin Gershon and Dr. Kara Margulis. A little bit about our moderators. Uh, Dr. Margulis is Associate Professor of Pediatrics, Molecular Pathobiology and Cell Biology at New York University, uh, NYU College of Dentistry, and NYU Grossman School of Medicine where she's Associate Director of the NYU Pain Center. Uh, Dr. Margulis is a pediatric gastroenterologist and a physician scientist with clinical and scientific expertise in disorders that affect the gut and the brain, including disorders of gut-brain interactions, as well as gastrointestinal problems in children with autism spectrum disorders. In the laboratory, Dr. Margulis leads clinical translational and basic science research programs whose themes center around gut serotonin signaling mechanisms in the gut brain axis conditions. <laughs> Our other moderator is Dr. Jamie Belkin Gershon, who is director of the clinical neurogastroenterology and motility program at Children's Hospital of Colorado. He also directs the enteric nervous system research lab at the University of Colorado where he's Associate Professor of Pediatrics. His gastroenterology and motility program with clinical and basic research um, has been currently funded for many years by the NIH. The focus of Jamie's investigative work is actually on the enteric nervous system injury and repair. So I'd like to uh, welcome our two moderators. And at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, both of them to continue our program. Thank you so much, uh, Nicholas, for the uh, nice introduction. Our first speaker today is Dr. Colin Reardon talking about neuroimmune regulation of enteric bacterial infection. The Reardon Lab at the University of California, where Dr. Reardon works, is focused on understanding how communication between neurons in the periphery can regulate immune cell function and inflammation. They are particularly interested in enteric bacterial infection endotoxemia, and acute lung inflammation. Using a combination of pharma pharmacological, genetic, and optogenetic approaches, they are uncovering neuroimmune circuits that not only allow for reduction of inappropriate inflammation, but could also be used to fine-tune host protective responses. These approaches have identified TRPV1 positive sensory innervation and neurotransmitters from this innervation in regulating discrete aspects of the immune response to bacterial pathogens. Before Dr. Reardon speaks, I would like to remind the audience to please ask any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. The questions will be addressed at the end of the session during the Q&A section. It is important not to type any answers to questions during the symposia so that it does not take away time to discuss questions during the Q&A session. Without further ado, I welcome uh, Dr. Reardon and I uh, ask him to set his slides, please. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so hopefully everyone can see my slides. I'm trying to advance. So I'd like to uh, first start by thanking all the people who actually did the work that you're about to see uh, throughout the lab. Um, and mostly you're going to see the work of this talented graduate student, Michael Kremen, uh, and recently a postdoc or postdoc who left the lab to go work in industry as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank our core facilities, um, the Grow Lab, and of course the funding agencies for, for helping do this work. Now I thought this is a, an opportunity to discuss neuroimmune circuits uh, in general before launching into the intestinal inflammation portion at least. 
Uh, and I think really neuroimmunity and neuroimmune interactions have become uh, this, this very large topic area, luckily for us, um, and it encompasses systemic inflammation, intestinal inflammation, and we're also interested in lung inflammation. But obviously for this talk, I thought what might be interesting at least is to think a little bit and, and address some of these aspects of systemic inflammation, what's known there. And because there is, it's been informative, at least for us, uh, when looking at the intestine. So the elephant in the room is the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway uh, that has um, really been established by Kevin Tracy and colleagues through you know, at least 20, 30 years worth of work. And that's summarized here on one slide and one figure. And really for, for anyone who's not initiated with this, it's really just the bi-directional communication between neurons and immune cells. And in this particular reflex, it holds the vagal afferents sort of here, detect inflammation or potentially uh, PAMPs, so products from, micro, from um, bacterial products, uh, from pathogens, those sorts of things. And this information gets uh, coordinated within the brainstem and there's an efferent, an outgoing signal that gets sent out and, and that there's um, a, an effect on a very specific cell population uh, of T cell population that can make acetylcholine and these actually can tamp down inflammation. This is the sort of start and the, the, the beginning of reemergence of, of work and neuroimmunity. Uh, and I think, you know, very interesting uh, types of aspects here, at least, is that it doesn't just have to be a, a reflex arc, that this pathway can be elicited by uh, electrical stimulation or other aspects of stimulating these nerves. And that the end result is to turn down inflammatory tone, to tamp down inflammation through reduction of NF-kappa B signaling and ultimately TNF-alpha production, amongst many other uh, cytokines now, but that's historically its role. Now, from a um, disease therapeutic and, and sort of interest, obviously NF-kappa B and TNF-alpha are, are king amongst many diseases. And, and the infographics here aren't for anyone to go through and, and sort of pick apart these from both rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, but it's just to say that there are many Americans and many people worldwide that are living with inflammatory disorders that could have potential to be impacted by these types of novel therapies, therapies that are not based on biologics that maybe have different safety profiles and potentially different efficacies. So there's a lot of interest in, in these therapies uh, in general. Uh, and obviously with IBD, there are some um, clinical trials, open label clinical trials that I'm not gonna go into that are suggesting there really is a tight correlation or the ability of, of neuroimmune circuits to control inflammation in disease states such as this. This led us, our, our group, to posit and think about what about an intestinal inflammation and maybe not in models of, of colitis necessarily, but what about enteric bacterial infection? Inflammation is driven um, by infection and we were interested in at least what's capable of detecting uh, inflammation or in response to these bacteria or potentially the bacteria themselves, and what effect does that have on the host response? So again, this comes back to the Kevin Tracy, um, you know, making this famous uh, amongst many other people. If you're watching and I'm not citing your paper, talking about your paper, uh, it's mostly for the sake of time. Obviously, Isaac Chow's lab has really um, blown the doors wide open on this as well, but many different sensory neurons can detect this. And so we thought that well, of those sensory uh, neurons, they express many different types of receptors, including TRPV1, which is known as a polymodal nociceptive protein, and it detects things like capsaicin, heat, immune products, and LPS. And this is not us saying this. This is, this is many uh, years of work and literature by many different people. Uh, and so our idea was that perhaps these neurons are actually functioning in a critical way to correlate immune function. And so our hypothesis is that, yes, in fact, that they would be important in, in doing this and uh, providing host protective immunity and during enteric bacterial infection. And the model that we chose to use is Citrobacter redemption. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is a mouse adapted um, attaching and effacing pathogen. So it has similar virulence mechanisms to enteropathogenic E. coli and enterohemorrhagic E. coli in human. It has a very well characterized course of disease luckily for us. Um, and so what we decided to do was use this model and ask about whether or not TRPV1 was going to be important. And the way we did this is to use this excitatory toxin, resveratrol toxin, that's a naturally derived product of cactus, these guys over here, 
And what this does is essentially locks the channel open, and this becomes excitotoxic to any cell that expresses TRPV1, including the neurons. And so our schema is basically here. We treat the mice with resveratrol in our vehicle. We infect with citrobacter dentium or give them LB broth. And then we look at various time points post that I've indicated here. Day 10, at least in our animal colony, is peak of infection, typically by day 29, day 30 is where we'd have clearance. And you can look at all kinds of these uh, different parameters for indicating what the host response is and how the host is dealing with bacterial infection. And so uh, this work was published in Infection Immunity a few years ago now, but what I think you can see is that in animals that are treated with RTX, so removing TRPV1 uh, positive cells, and most of these are actually going to be neurons, uh, at least that we've seen, uh, you can see that there's a significant increase in the bacterial burden of Citrobacter rodentium. It, this is in the feces and then in, in the colonic bacteria as well, compared to the vehicle control. And vehicle controls are actually clearing uh, by day 30. We don't really see that. There's a delayed clearance, at least, there. If you look at now uh, histopathology, you can see that there's uh, changes there as well. Uh, so here's our vehicle-treated mice. And these guys are infected. I don't know why my labels have disappeared, but um, vehicle-infected mice, there's obvious crypt hyperplasia. You can do this by measuring uh, the, the distance, essentially, or the crypt length. And uh, you can see that in the RTX-treated animals, there's a significant increase in the crypt length. So there's more crypt hyperplasia there. When we started to look at mechanisms uh, that might be actually causing this, we saw that there was a reduced T cell recruitment. So here I'm just showing you the confocal and then the summary over here, uh, quantification. We see that 10 days post-infection are vehicle treated. We have T cells that are recruited, um, but in the RTX treated animals, so again, lacking the sensory innervation or trip one sensory neurons, we see there's significantly less T cells that are recruited. And then there's a rebound or a resurgence of these T cells that come in. And we've also confirmed this by flow cytometry as well. When we started looking at potential mechanisms that could explain this, we saw that uh, we started looking at, at molecules on endothelial cells or, or that are known to cause recruitment of T cells into inflamed tissue. And we can see that there was a significant decrease in the amount of MADCAM1. This is a, a cell adhesion molecule that's expressed on the endothelial cell surface that allows recruitment of alpha-4, beta-7 bearing T cells into the infected tissue. And again, it's down and then nicely mirroring what happens with the amount of T cells at day 29, you can see there's a significant rebound that occurs there as well. So suggesting that the changes that we're seeing are due to a reduced recruitment of these T cells. Now, loss of, of the trp one um, or of those trp one neurons led to increased bacterial burden, but this is really different than saying the, that's the function of trp one right? That when we kill those neurons, we're not just removing the input of trp one we're removing anything that those neurons would express, neuropeptides, anything, any other product. And so uh, Michael Kremen, graduate student in the lab, uh, decided that he wanted to look at what is the specific contribution of trp one in the Citrobacter rodentia model. And so this was recently published in PLOS Pathogens, uh, EPUB 2023, and then um, actually in the end of this year, or beginning of this year rather, um, can see that trp one deficiency significantly increases the amount of Citrobacter rodentium that's found in the feces and also in the colon, and that the histopathology or the, the, the consequence, the immunopathology of this infection is also significantly worse uh, in these animals. There's more crypt hyperplasia here, uh, and we've also shown this with KI-67. So there's more epithelial proliferation, there's more of a response, an inflammatory response that's actually occurring within these animals. Here's our carrier 67. We, we looked at this specifically for a few different reasons. Um, so you can see here's our trp one knockout. There's significant increase in the number of KI-67 positive cells. They're going all the way up the crypts, um, at least at day 10. This is somewhat normalized by day 29, um, or at least not different rather than the wild type control. We looked at this specifically because trp one had been uh, reported to be expressed on different clonic epithelial cell lines and that stimulating through this receptor could drive expression. We didn't see that at all in vivo. We also looked at clonic organoids derived from wild type and trp one knockout mice. So no difference in epithelial proliferation. And so 
we think that this increase, <clears throat> excuse me, increase in epithelial cell proliferation is really driven by the bacterial burden. This is not something about um, either enhancing or restraining in a cell epithelial cell intrinsic manner. We think this is about the response to the actual pathogen. And it's not just simply uh, that localized effect or that cell intrinsic effect. We started looking at uh, CD4 positive T cells as um, we're an immunology lab or mostly an immunology lab. Um, we saw that there was really no difference in the recruitment of, of CD3 positive, CD4 positive T cells uh, in the lamina propria. And there's some differences, at least in IL-17, but this is not really uh, what I would call a, a statistically significant, but I didn't think this was biologically going to be that relevant. Um, IL-17 and IL-22, of course, are, are key cytokines that are responsible for the, the host response here that are host protective and driving out uh, or, or causing a recovery from citrobacter infection. So there's slight differences here, um, but I didn't think that was necessarily it. And so I asked Michael to continue looking and, and expand on his flow cytometry panel. And what we found was that citrobacter edentium causes a massive recruitment in the number of neutrophils uh, in the clonic lamina propria. And it has been known for quite some time, we're not the first people to say that neutrophils are important. Uh, if you deplete neutrophils, it's, it's, it's been known for at least 20 years that this was um, bad for the host. Um, here, what we see though, is that the neutrophils are recruited normally in a wild type animal, but there's a significant reduction in the number of these neutrophils that get recruited in an infected TRPD1 knockout mix. So you can see this both by frequency and also by the number of, of these live cells in the clonic lamina propria. We started thinking about um, why this might be, and we, we went through and did a, a very extensive characterization on, on neutrophil development in the bone marrow and the progenitors, and we found no difference whatsoever in wild type or TRPD1 knockouts, either under uh, naive or citro-infected conditions. And so we started thinking about, well, is it just about their recruitment into the colon? And what we saw was, in fact, there was. So here we're looking at flow cytometry, looking at endothelial cells specifically, and then different adhesion molecules on their cell surface um, in either uninfected um, wild types and, um, and TRP1 knockout mice. Um, and then post-infection, you can see that infection drives increased amounts of ICAM, ICAM-1 and VCAM-1 in the wild-type mice post-infection. But that doesn't actually happen in our trip one knockout mice. There's significantly less ICAM-1 and significantly less VCAM-1 on those endothelial cell surface 10 days post-infection. And so we think this is a mechanism where um, whereby we have less recruitment of these neutrophils into the lamina propria at that time point. So to quickly summarize so far what I've told you before I get onto uh, some newer and unpublished data, um, since I like not seeing unpublished data in these kinds of seminars, there are many different types of neuroimmune circuits and the components of these circuits can participate in host pathogen interactions in a context dependent manner. TRPD1 positive neurons, are critical in the coordination um, and factors from these neurons are critical for the coordination of uh, response to an enteric bacterial pathogen. And we think this is through regulation of innate immune cell recruitment. But one of the outstanding questions remained, but what's the actual source? Here we, we drew in our, our summary figure, figure that there's neuropeptides coming from trp one positive neurons. And we didn't, but we don't know what these were. We didn't know what those were. And so what we decided to do was, was go back to the literature and see what other people had done. And of course, substance P, as perhaps one of the oldest known neurotransmitters, has a long history of being pro-inflammatory, at least in intestinal inflammation. And so what we decided to do was look at whether or not uh, substance P receptor blockade would have any impact whatsoever in our uh, citrobacter dentium model. So here, what we've done, in fact, um, which is wild type black six mice with citrobacter dentium and treat with either vehicle or this highly selective substance P receptor antagonist that's quite old and, and well characterized, CP96345. And we can see that there's actually a significant decrease in bacterial burden at various time points. Keep in mind, this is a log curve here. And if you look at 
uh, day 10 specifically, look at feces or colonic bacteria, then mice that are treated with the substance P receptor antagonist have a significant reduction in the amount of bacteria present. This also meshes or matches with the immunopathology, um, or at least the histopathology that's typically induced, looking at K67. In this case, and just the summary here, you can see at day 10, mice pretreated or treated with CP96345, substance P receptor antagonist, experience significantly less intestinal epithelial cell proliferation. Now, and this is similar at day 29 between vehicle and antagonist treated. What are the potential mechanisms for this? Well, we started looking again back at T cells, and we've done this by confocal. Here, I'm showing you the confocal. Animals treated with CP96345, significant reduced amounts of T cells into the clonic lamina appropriate 10 days post-infection, and even there's less um, out towards day 29 compared to the vehicle treated mice. This is summarized here. We've also done this by flow cytometry, and further characterization shows that there's a reduced CD4 positive interferon gamma positive T cells, and overall there's less interferon gamma and IL-17 message in the clonic uh, and clonic tissues of, of these uh, substance C receptor antagonist treated mice <clears throat> at that time point compared to vehicle control. And my part went stuck. Okay. <clears throat> Thinking again of, of mechanisms now, you go back to our, our old standby flow cytometry and look at the blood endothelial cells. And this time we can see, yes, infection induces increases in such about, or sorry, increases. Um, expression, cell surface expression of ICAM on blood endothelial cells from infected colonic uh, tissues. This isn't changed by CP96345, substance P receptor antagonist. Same story for VCAM. <clears throat> but when we look at MADCAM expression, we see a significant decrease in the amount of MADCAM um, uh, that's on the cell surface of those blood endothelial cells coming from infected mice that are, are treated with the substance P receptor antagonist. Okay, so substance P receptor uh, has lots of different roles by many different cell types. And so if we're giving a pharmacological antagonist, you know, there's lots of things that could be infected. And so what we decided to do was to use a conditional knockout approach. Since so many people previously in other contexts have focused on T cells and T cell intrinsic effects, we thought this was a great target to start first. And that's what we did. So we took, uh, we made a novel uh, TACR1 flux flux mouse crosses with LCK Cree. So this is a T cell conditional knockout of TACR1. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we saw no difference in T cell recruitment. That's here. So those animals have the same number of T cells that get recruited post infection. But when you start looking at the types of T cells that are there by doing intracellular cytokine staining, we see significant differences in the amount of interferon gamma positive T cells that are present. We also see reduced interferon gamma message in the colon of these mice um, as well. So it's a nice sort of corollary for the flow cytometry data. But what are these neuropeptides? Um, we think that it's substance P based on the work that I've just shown you. Uh, and we think that substance P receptor is obviously playing a role. There's all kinds of nice uh, um, complicating factors, perhaps good for us in a way, and that it makes sure that we have lots of things to do. There's more than one, one ligand for substance P receptor. Um, tachykinin 4, TAC4, for example, encodes not only hem hemokinin 1, but also this endokinin A and endokinin B. And so I think there's lots of potential for different ligands to work through substance P receptor and fine tune a host defense uh, <clears throat> and the resulting inflammation during enteric bacterial infection. And so with that, thank you very much for your attention. Hey, thank you, Dr. Reardon, for that beautiful talk. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Jada De Palma. Dr. De Palma is an assistant professor at the Fancombe Family Digestive Health Research Institute at McMaster University. The focus of her research is on the study of interactions between the microbiome, diet, gut physiology, and behavior in disorders of gut-brain interactions and mental health. She has a specific interest in microbial function. So tonight, Dr. De Palma is going to provide a look into the ongoing conversation between gut microbes, the enteric nervous system, and immune cells. Thank you, Cara, for the kind introduction, and thank you again for inviting me today to give this talk. 
So we have heard about the microbiome from Colin and we really don't need this introduction. But just a reminder, the microbiome is that ensemble of archaea, bacteria, viruses, and eukaryotes that lives in symbiosis with us, and it's key for our health and homeostasis. The importance of the microbiome is highlighted by studies in uh, germ-free mice, where uh, it is uh, shown that germ-free mice present with physiologic and metabolic abnormalities compared to conventional animals, imbalanced immune system, an altered internal nervous system, an altered perception of inflammatory, mechanical, and visceral pain, and altered gastrointestinal motility. And this is just to name few. We have also done a little bit of work on um, uh, motility and the role of gut microbiome in motility. And we have shown that, uh, the, that uh, the microbiome regulates gastrointestinal transit. Here you can see that uh, germ-free germ animals in blue have a, a slower gastrointestinal transit, while normal conventional animal SPF have a faster gastrointestinal transit and monocolonized mice with either E. coli in green or lactobacillus in uh, orange have a, 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 a different gastrointestinal transit from germ-free animals, but you can also tell that uh, the microbiome modulates the uh, intestinal transit depending on the species of bacteria. And so we did some mechanistic studies there and found that uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide actually was modulating these uh, changes in gastrointestinal transit, especially in the small intestine. As you can see here, the quantification of uh, VIP in the small intestine of these uh, monoclonized mice and uh, the germ-free and conventional mice. And you can tell here too that uh, it depends on the type of bacteria that are colonized in the gut. So there we also demonstrated that uh, uh, VIP was controlling cholinergic nerves, and here is just a representative picture where you can see that uh, VIP positive uh, fibers and uh, uh, chat positive fibers were colocalized. We did some uh, mechanistic study with uh, genetically modified animals and saw that these results were dependent on uh, MyDATH rif pathways, which are downstream of uh, uh, microbial recognition and also were dependent on uh, glial cells. We also uh, looked a little bit into the role of microbiome and uh, visceral pain and uh, showed that uh, visceral uh, sensitivity to colorectal distension is modulated by the, micro, uh, by the gut microbiome. You can see here the representative traces of visceral motor responses to uh, three volumes of distension in conventional SPF mice and germ-free mice. And you can see that it's increased in germ-free mice, the visceral motor responses are increased. And we also show that uh, the stimulated CGRP production by dorsal root ganglion neurons uh, are greater in, uh, is greater in germ-free mice, especially in females. So we show, and others, of course, many others, show that the gut microbiome is important for gut physiology, and we know that the gut microbiome is also important for that bidirectional communication that exists between uh, the brain and uh, the gut. This is um, not a new concept, the gut-brain axis, and uh, there is plenty of evidence now to show that uh, the microbiome plays a role and can modulate brain and brain function and behavior. And these are just the few first seminal papers that came out already more than a decade ago, where they show, for example, that early phase of acute infection with Campylobacter jejuni results in altered behaviors in mice, that um, chronic infection with H. pylori induces abnormal feeding behavior in mice, which associate with an upregulation of TNF-alpha in the brain of these mice, that the brain development and normal behavior are regulated by a gut microbiota, as well as that the gut microbiota and its metabolites, such as, for example, short-chain fatty acids, can influence problem barrier permeability in mice and control microglia function and maturation. 
we have done also some work on the role of gut microbiome and behavior, and we have done so again using germ-free animals, conventional animals. You can see here they're called permanently colonized animals and notobiotic animals. And we used here two tests uh, to measure exploratory behavior and depression-like behavior. For the exploratory behavior, we use the light preference test. It's a test where you place the mouse on, in a box that has two compartments, a lit compartment and a, a dark compartment, and you measure the time that the mouse spends in each compartment. A longer time in the light is indicative of exploratory behavior because mice are um, shy animals and prefer to be in the dark. For depression-like behavior, we use the tail suspension test. We hang uh, a mouse from the tip of its tail and measure the time that it spends immobile. A longer time uh, immobile is indicative of depression-like behavior. So you can see here that the germ-free animals in gray uh, present with more exploratory behavior and less depression-like behavior than the permanently colonized mice in green. And when we colonize germ-free animals with specific pathogen-free microbiota, so the same of these green animals, we see the same result. And when we colonize with a more simple microbiota, the Shadler flora microbiota, which is only seven strains, we see the same result, meaning that the colonization with both complex and simple microbiota induces changes in behavior. We looked a little bit into the mechanism, and uh, you can see here, this is wild type, and we see the same results as I just show you, so more exploratory behavior in the germ-free animals. When we use skid mice, which lack completely B and T cells, so the uh, adaptive arm of the immune system, we see the same differences. But when we use my D88 TCAM knockout mice, which lack um, those, um, the, those pathway downstream, uh, the microbial recognition uh, signaling, we don't see any difference in behavior, meaning that innate immunity through toler receptor signaling mediates changes in exploratory behavior. So in this paper that hopefully will get published soon, we show that normal behavior uh, development is regulated by gut microbiota and that the innate immune system plays a key role in shaping normal behavior and in the initial microbiota gut-brain communication. So we show how important is the microbiota to this communication. And we have to keep in mind that this bidirectional communication is in a delicate equilibrium and any perturbation at any point in time in life can lead to disorders. For example, this is the case of certain um, mental health disorders. And there is a very nice study out of Denmark uh, showing um, that infection and antibiotic at early age associate with a later risk of mental disorders, uh, as you can see here, and uh, later uh, use of psychotropic medication. And there is now a lot of evidence as well to show that those uh, disorders thought to be confined to the brain are indeed uh, affecting the gut and the gut microbiome. And this is just a few examples of a nice study uh, that show that patients with generalized anxiety and major depression present with altered microbiota profiles. Neurodegenerative disorders have also been associated with altered microbiota profile. Social stressors uh, are shown to alter gut microbiota structure in mice. And we have shown that microbiome is a key determinant of behavior in a mouse model of early life stress, such as the maternal separation model. Um, so, but we also have, uh, when we have this disrupted bidirectional communication, we have those so-called uh, disorder of gut-brain interaction. And uh, one disorder of gut-brain interaction is irritable bowel syndrome, which is uh, by definition, a chronic disorder of uh, brain-gut interaction characterized by recurrent abdominal pain and altered bowel habit in the absence of any underlying discernible pathology. We know that uh, the microbiome is central to IBS pathophysiology, and we know uh, now that the intestinal microbiota has been implicated in the expression of IBS as patients present with altered gut microbial profiles and microbial metabolic activity. 
We have shown uh, some time ago already uh, a causal role for the microbiome. When we transplanted uh, the fecal microbiota from patients with IBS and diarrhea predominant into germ-free mice and show that this induced faster intestinal transit, impaired barrier function, low-grade inflammation, and altered serum metabolism in these notobiotic mice. And the take-home message for me from this study was that the focus should be on the microbial function rather than on the microbial composition. And I think this is really well shown uh, by this uh, plot, the 16S plot of the composition of the gut microbiota. Uh, you can see this is a uh, a break uh, plot, and you can see that there is not a great separation between uh, the IBS colonized mice in red and the healthy colonized mice in blue. But when we looked at the serum metabolism of these mice, we could see a complete separation between IBS and healthy colonized mice in both unsupervised and supervised analysis, meaning that the microbial function should um, should uh, require our research focus. And so uh, microbial function refers to uh, what the microbes do and what they secrete. And we know that the microbiome is able to secrete and consume neurotransmitter and neuroactive compounds, and that the microbiome interacts with endogenous and exogenous molecules, altering their bioavailability, and ultimately uh, this affects the host. So. Um, of course, we are not the only one that uh, focus on microbial metabolism, and there are uh, very uh, many good work uh, out there. But while I can't possibly uh, talk about them all, I would like to highlight a very good uh, study uh, that comes from Dr. Kashi at Group Amayo, um, where um, they show with the longitudinal uh, multi-omic uh, clinical trial uh, that uh, uh, symptom severity in IBS patients was associated with functional changes in the gut microbiota. And they also show that the IBS microbiome has an increased capacity for iposanting utilization and breakdown. And uh, finally, they show that this decrease in hypoxantin might result from an increased santin oxidase activity from both the microbiome and the host. And I think it was really nice because they, uh, for the first time, they show that an epoxanting is changed and is altered in IBS, both um, IBS-C and IBS-D. But they also found a possible therapeutic uh, target, uh, stantin oxidase, and uh, that has already an inhibitor commercially available. So when we study microbial uh, function, we focus uh, on diet-microbiota interaction in the lab. And we do this because we know that diet is a major modulator of microbiome composition and function, and that the microbiome is the key mediator of the physiological effects of diet. We also know that IBS patients often report food-induced symptoms such as abdominal pain and bloating and make dietary modification to manage those symptoms. Gluten-free and low fermentable carbohydrate diets, such as the low FODMAP diet, are the most adopted by IBS patients. However, the mechanism underlying their beneficial uh, effects are uh, not well understood. It is definitely possible uh, that uh, there is a, a central component to this beneficial effect. And, and in fact, uh, there is evidence to show that uh, uh, increased uh, symptoms responses to fractants, which are FODMAPs in IBS associated with altered brain responses in brain-related regions. So, but, um, but in the lab, we focus more on the peripheral mechanisms. And already many years ago, we uh, collaborated with Dr. Uh, Stephen Vanner and Dr. David Reed at Queen's University in a study where we show that restricting fermentable carbohydrates FODMAPs affects IBS symptoms, gut microbiota profile, and urine histamine level. And uh, that histamine caught our attention because it's a key neuroimmune mediator that is produced by mast cells and also by bacteria. Mast cells have been heavily implicated in, patho in the pathophysiology of IBS before. So we went back and looked at that data again and found a positive correlation between pain <clears throat> and histamine in those patients. And 
thus hypothesized that perhaps gum microbiota contributes to visceral hyperalgesia through production of histamine. In order to investigate this, we um, used our humanized mouse model where we took uh, germ-free mice and colonized them with these two samples of patients from that previous study with either high urinary histamine here in red, IBS-HH, low urinary histamine here in blue, IBS-LH, or controls. After three weeks, we did an, a battery of in vivo and in vitro assessment. And <clears throat> we kept all during the whole duration of the experiment, <clears throat> the mice on a, either a low or a high fermentable carbohydrate diet to probe for histamine production. So the first thing we observed in these mice, it was that the IBS HH colonized mice in red presented with increased visceral motor responses to colorectal distension. And you can see here representative traces for these mice to both um, with the responses to both uh, these volumes, distension. And you can see here the data summarized. As well, we observed that ex vivo colonic afferent nerves mechanosensitivity significantly increased in IBS HH colonized mice. We looked at the colon of these mice and we observed that there was an increase in mast cells in the, uh, in the colon of these mice and these mast cells were in close proximity to nerves. This is reminiscent of the work of Dr. Giovanni Barbara already two decades ago, where he sees, he saw that um, in the colon of IBS patients, uh, there are an increased number of mast cells and these mast cells are in close proximity to nerve endings. So we wanted to know what was uh, mediating this uh, mastocytosis in the colon of, of these mice and uh, measure histamine receptor 4, which is uh, a receptor that has higher affinity uh, for histamine than receptor 1 and 2, and as well as been uh, implicated previously in visceral pain and um, mast cell chemotaxis and migration. And we observed that histamine 4 receptor was increased in this IBS uh, HH colonized mice, and as well, when we blocked this receptor, we saw a decrease in mast cells in the colon of these mice and a decrease in visceral um, motor responses to colorectal distension to both volume of distension. So we knew now that uh, these mast cells were accumulating in the colon and this was mediated by the H4 receptor, but we also wanted to do what was driving this uh, uh, mastocytosis. So we turn our attention to the bacteria, to the microbiome of these mice and found that the IBS HH colonized mice microbiota had a much higher capacity to produce histamine in vitro when given excess histidine. Um, this was true in both mice and patients, and we identified the main histamine producer as Klebsiella aerogenes. This is a gram-negative bacterium that possesses the enzyme histidine decarboxylase that converts histidine into histamine. We genetically modify this uh, isolate to lose the capacity to produce histamine and monocolonized mice and found, sorry, uh, and found that monocolonized mice with this uh, genetically modified strain presented with a significantly lower numbers of mast cells in the colon in comparison to monocolonized mice with the original strain or an unrelated Klebsiella strain. So we concluded that bacterial histamine indeed was driving mastocytosis in these mice. When we put these mice on a low fermentable diet, because if you remember, uh, the patient in our original clinical trial were on a low fermentable diet and their histamine decreased. When we do this in the mice, we see a significant decrease in histamine production in these mice and a significant decrease in visceral motor responses uh, to uh, colorectal distension as well. We think that lactic acid was mediating this effect to low fermentable diet because we observe a significant decrease in lactic acid in this IBSHH colonized mice and a significant decrease in lactic acid bacteria as well. But when we put these mice on a low fermentable diet, we see an increase in lactic acid bacteria. And this makes sense because lactic acid would lower the pH and um, 
inactivate the uh, HDC gene of Klebsiella. So in summary, in that study, we think that in a subset of patients, bacterial histamine drive accumulation of mast cells in the colon through the activity of the H4 receptor. And this accumulation of mast cells uh, leads to an increased uh, secretion of histamine, which in turn leads to sensitization of sensory neuron through the activity of the H1, H1 receptor. We um, <clears throat> show that fermentable carbohydrates are able to modulate this capacity to produce histamine, and we are now <clears throat> investigating the role of histamine metabolism in both bacteria and host. So I hope I convinced you that aberrant microbial metabolism might underlie symptoms generation in a subset of patients with a disorder of gut-brain interaction, such as IBS, that <clears throat> visceral sensitivity can be shaped by an individual gut microbial community, and that the manipulation of microbial function through diet microbial directed therapies appears to be a viable option <clears throat> in a subset of patients. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge all the people that took part in this works that I shown, uh, especially the leaders of the Berchi Collins Laboratory and all the members, as well as our close collaborators, uh, Dr. Stephen Banner and Dr. David Reed at Queen's University and our funding agency. And I thank you for your attention. Great, Giada, thank you for that beautiful talk. So we can now go to the, to the chat. Um, Jaime, if you want to look up, if you want to start and go to the questions there. Absolutely. Here, let's start with this first one. It says, uh, great talk and so much learning. I have two quick questions. What would be the therapeutic approach for altered neuroimmune function mediating gut pain in DGBI? Is it prime time in clinics to quantify neuroimmune proximity in biopsy samples in the pain predominant IBS or functional dyspepsia patient population. The second question is, do bacterial infections cause long lasting or permanent damage to cells involved in neuroimmune interactions? What would be the possible way for FODMAP diet, um, FMT intervention to rescue the damaged cells, particularly in the post-infection DGBI model? Um, either uh, speaker, please, Feel free to chime in. Happy, happy to answer. I'm just sorry. I'm reading them again because it's a it's a dense question. And <laughs> um, I don't, Colin, if you want to take one of those, um, sure. I guess. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I I guess um, um. We could quantify uh, neuroimmune proximity. Uh, lots of people have um, have, um, have uh, looked at mast cells and the proximity to nerves, and um, not everybody is able to find um, this increase in mast cells. So um, I wouldn't. And so it's it it seems it's a, it's a finding in a subset of patients with IBS. Um, it, it has been found by many groups. Um, and what we show is that uh, these particular findings uh, are in this uh, high histamine producing microbiota is in a subset of IBS patients. So, um, I'm not sure, and I'm not a clinician, so I'm not sure that we should advocate for quantification of neuroimmune proximity in all, every patient, but I guess, um, it's um, when when uh, the patient goes for biopsy, maybe it's a it's a good idea to to do immunohistochemistry and and look at the. I'll I'll chime in there two seconds. Yeah. Every once in a while, we do have a request, maybe Cara to to look at the biopsies and see if there's a hyperdensity of mast cells. Um, most people don't, but every once in a while, clinicians will request it. But we do use. Um, some interesting uh, agents for this. And, you know, we use saproheptidine, especially for upper GI uh, pain and vomiting disorders. Saproheptidine is a uh, kind of a dirty drug, but it does have antihistaminic properties. And of course, we use antibiotics for what we call bacterial overgrowth. 
So the the so, and and there's definitely success with both the ciproheptadine and with antibiotics for you know for uh, lower upper and lower functional disorders. So I think I think what you what you have found makes sense to try to explain this a little bit. Um, and um, um, does anybody want to answer the other question, or should we move on? Um, I'll chime in there for a sec. You know, I, I think. It, these make a good point about looking at neuroimmune interactions and and whether we look at a static picture. But something I'd I'd like the audience to consider, or, or, and you know, feel free to chime in as well, if people, you know, is that just seeing where things are doesn't necessarily tell you function. And I think we're still in that this very much an infancy of this field to really understand how these things are interacting and what signals, just because you know a certain type of neuron is there, that doesn't mean we understand what signal is actually coming out of that nerve or what signal is acting on that nerve to elicit a functional biologically relevant change. The second question I think is amazing and is something that, that we are absolutely interested. So hopefully you will be on a study section at some point and, and agree with my grant. Um, we know absolutely nothing about how these circuits, we call them circuits, and that for some people makes them think about electronics and wires and things like that. And that's completely wrong. These are living cells that are experiencing inflammation, they're experiencing changes in their local environment. And as a consequence, the way they perceive information and interact with other cells are going to change. So bacterial infection, does that lead to long lasting changes? I don't think anyone really knows for certain. There's some evidence um, I, that that I think will be published soon, not from our group, um, that suggests this may be a real thing. And, and absolutely, but how critical is that? How do those changes actually occur? This is These are all open questions. So if students are watching this, this is a ripe field to, to really plot a, a, your future course in, and I would encourage you to do that. Very good. Well, while more questions come in, Cara, do you have uh, any personal no, questions? Yeah, sure. I have, I have, I think, questions for each of you. I think, Jada, you know, you talked, you know, the, the things that you raised about a low fermentable diet and H2 antagonists, we know that they work in some patients, but not others. And you at least, you provide a good case for looking at histamine levels in patients. So have you been looking at histamine levels? Do you think that that could be some sort of biomarker for a subset of patients that might respond to these treatments? Yeah, yeah, you, yes, you make a good point. We are um, actually uh, doing a pilot clinical trial where we are trying to figure out uh, if we can um, use histamine as, as a biomarker, either in the urine or in the functional assays as we do them uh, from the microbiota. And so we are blind uh, now, so I can't, we don't know. Uh, we see changes, but we don't know what do they uh, correspond to. So it's difficult to say, but that would be what we, what we would like to see, whether this is, this can be used as a biomarker. And then for the use of antihistamine, um, yeah, we know the 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 efficacy is not uh, very high. It works in a subset of patients, so the idea would be to try to figure out which patient may benefit from, example, from an H1 receptor plus uh, maybe a combination therapy with other um, drugs. And if the H4 receptor antagonist was commercially available, that would be nice, but it's uh, it's not. Great. Thank you. And Colin, is there a role for the, col the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway in host protective immune responses during bacterial infection? Yeah, absolutely. Since I introduced it uh, early on in my talk, um, there is and there isn't. So so I, I alluded to part of it, part of this answer, and this is a very hand wavy uh, question uh, or answer to that question. Um, what we have found is that those T cells that are keystones, fundamental part of the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway that Kevin Trace established. So these are T cells that make acetylcholine. They respond to sympathetic neurotransmitter um, in the spleen and the release of acetylcholine there turns off TNF alpha production and bad things from happening in models of endotoxemia. We have found those same cells uh, are actually present in the colonic lamina propria. They exist there at low levels. Citrobacter edentium infection, at least that's the only model that we've tested of an infectious model, causes a massive increase in the number of these cells. This doesn't happen in DSS-induced colitis or other models of intestinal inflammation. It's something specific about citrobacter. 
Uh, we published this work in Plus Pathogens uh, in 2019, I believe, uh, some of this work. Um, so absolutely, it's involved. There are components that are involved. It's probably not CAPE by itself, but there are components of CAPE that act in these different ways. And so that's sort of what I was trying to get at a little bit in the conclusion that when we understand a pathway, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only role, you know, that, that these acetylcholine producing cells may actually have lots of different roles that we just don't understand. They're not just integral to CAPE. They're probably not just about responding to Citrobacter. You know, we, maybe they're in the lung, maybe they help. We, we just don't know. And there's, there's so many avenues to pursue. All in just to keep it very simple, this is probably a very ridiculous question and oversimplified, but if the parasympathetic system is anti-inflammatory, what happens to sympathetic? And can this explain the enormous amount of patients that we have with chronic pain in these days of stress and anxiety? Yeah, I, and that, that's a fantastic question. And I won't touch the clinical aspects with a 10-foot pole not being a clinician. But I, I think it really will depend on, on some patient specifics. So depend in, in at least a mouse model or preclinical models, um, catecholamines, especially epinephrine, norepinephrine, it sort of depends on the cells and, and what the environment they've been in. It, the amount of receptor, whether it's adrenergic or, or um, a beta adrenergic or alpha adrenergic receptor can change. It's referred to a switch. Right. So in one context, you could have norepinephrine or epinephrine be anti-inflammatory. And in another context, the same concentration could actually drive the opposite response. So I think it's it's way more complicated than even we appreciate at this level. And re it really makes me leery about talking about this clinical um, uh, context. But you're absolutely right. I, I, I think that in general, we would believe them to be an anti-inflammatory uh, effect. Um, we also have some exciting data, I hope that will make it into a preprint that say that sympathetics are also required in different aspects of uh, controlling enteric bacterial infection. So uh, lots of different roles, and I think they're going to be context specific. So that's a very hand wavy answer to your question, but. Um, Terrific. Okay. Do we I have think... a few more minutes? Do we have a few more minutes or do we have to wrap it up? I think because Nick's on, we probably, it's probably time to start wrapping it up. <laughs> so I'd say this has been a really wonderful session, um, and but we've run out of time. So any questions not addressed tonight will be addressed on Doc Matter. And then Jaime and I would like to thank, first of all, the ANMS for hosting this event, Drs. Reardon and De Palma for their wonderful talks, and of course, all of you for attending. Thank you and have a good night. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.